and we need you know a little chest a little bicep everything else to go with it but before we start my name is Evelyn Owala of Evil Health and Fitness you can follow us on E-V-E-A-L on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter you can get yourself a water bottle right we will be using that in our workout my water bottle is five liters you can get anything between five and three liters would be a good place to start but if you don't have that get whatever water bottle you have we'll make it do all right so we are going to build some shoulders some triceps some biceps today all right and our walk will start in a few minutes so get up get up get up because when this timer rings we will be ready for you okay there we go all right um let me put the timer on you have 30 more, more seconds to go 30 more seconds 30 seconds to go right 30 seconds to go 10 15 we are almost there so make sure you have yourself some water to drink during our workout and a towel just in case you need any because we are going to work this upper body and we are going to warm the upper body in the next few minutes right in the next few seconds not minutes not minutes <laughs> because now you're awake you have your water bottle already we have four seconds to go four seconds three seconds two seconds and there we go perfect perfect now we're going to start with our warm-up which is going to be this uh, jumping jacks yeah we're going to do jumping jacks combined with high knees so we're going to do 12 times three remember if you have an injury and you can't go through impact it's okay you can just do that 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 as one so that you're not able to put impact on your knees a lot of impact on your knees just in case it has you know an injury or your back is fragile so let's do this 12 times three right let's go one two three go one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve well done well done your rest time starts now walk around and if you're like me you're almost awake you're almost waking up now I know I know <laughs> Especially if you're the kind of person who's little finger wake up, middle finger, this is the time. All the fingers just wake up. We're doing this together. We are starting on a new normal here at NTV teasing new bunny. So we have five more seconds to go. Five more seconds to go. Three more seconds left. Two and one. Let's go. One, two, three, and move. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, 12, well done, your rest time starts now, you have successfully done the second set, which means you can run through the third set just in 30 seconds, so walk around, don't sit down, right, we are just starting our warm up, we're just getting things, you know, the body to know that we are around, we are doing this, we are starting on a new normal, we have new energy, so, 10 more, and let's start, 1, 2, 
One, two, three, move. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine.
if you did the two, definitely this is nothing to you. So let's get down and get this going. One, two, three, move. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. Well done, well done. You have successfully completed the first workout. We have the next workout. The next workout is chair dips. I will pull this chair to a workout station, right? And when you're doing chair dips, you hold in this position, right? The way I'm grabbing the seat, and you go down. Weigh all the weight on your arms. Don't use your legs to elevate yourself. <laughs> Don't use your legs to elevate yourself. Use your arms so that we put in pressure on this part of the arms. Our time's up. So that we are able to work it out. All right. So we're going to do 12 repetitions times three. 12 repetitions times three. Let's go. One, two, three, and start. One. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, one more, twelve. Well done, well done. Your rest time starts. Now, walk around, you can massage those babies, let them feel a little bit nice. Take some water, like myself, take some water. We have to live here with the fabulous upper body because this, this is quite something. Five more seconds to go. Four more seconds to go. Hands up, hands up, let's go. One, two, three, and move. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Nine, ten, eleven, one more, and twelve. Well done, well done, you did amazing. Our rest time starts now. You can move the seat on the side, and now we work out our tricep, right? Now we want to work out our shoulders. These babies here. When you're already feeling this, we need this to come in, right? <laughs> this and then this. So we need this and this to come in for us to have that fabulous look that we're looking for. So we're going to do um, a little bit of press and front raises. So so what we're going to do is this, take it down well. All right, I don't know if you caught that. So you're here, take it up, bring it here, down, and swing it to the front, one. So we're going to do 12, 12 times four, 12 times four. And then when we finish the four, we're going to go here, right? We're going to go nice and slow there. We're going to do our 20 repetitions, 20 circles nicely, nice and slow. Don't leave me behind, please. Please, the last time we did this, you left me behind. Please don't leave me behind. Let's go in a slow pace. Let's do this. One, two, three, and go. One. Two. Three. Seven, 
eight. seconds to go. Five more seconds to go. Time's up. Let's go. One, two, three and move. One, Eleven, twelve. Well done, well done, well done. Let's now draw the circles. One, two, three, move. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 
eight, nine, 10, 11, don't leave it behind. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. Well done, well done. Your rest time starts now. Your rest time starts now. So after this, we're going to do bicep curls, right? We're going to do bicep curls. A little more for these babies here, yes. These ones you're seeing, those ones, yes, those ones. So we need them also to come up a bit. We're going to combine bicep curls and we're going to grow a little bit for the back, yeah. So, you know, when you're talking about upper body, you need the chest to come in, you need the triceps to come in, and a little bit of back. So we are going, we have three more seconds to go. So we're going to combine the bicep curls and the back row. So let's go. One, two, three, one. Nice. Yes. That's how we're going to do it. So we're going to do 12 times three. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and right, twelve. All right, we're going to do rows one, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, you're doing well. Eight, just pull it to your chest. Nine, ten, eleven, and right, twelve. Our rest time starts now. Our rest time starts now. Our rest time starts now. You're doing well so far. Our rest time starts now. more seconds to go so we're going to do another set of bicep curls and rows so we have two more sets to go we are almost there you're doing amazing you brought this yourself this far there we go let's go one two three and move one two three four five Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Let's go for the roll. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine, ten, eleven, one more, and twelve. Well done, well done. The rest time starts now. The rest time starts now. You can walk around, walk around. Our upper body is coming through. Yes, we have 15 more seconds to go. 15 more seconds to go. 15 more seconds to go, 10 more seconds to go. You are doing amazing, amazing, amazing. Yes, just by waking up today to come and keep me company. Literally, you're keeping me company, but also starting your day with new energy or a new normal. Let's go. One, two, three, and go. One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and one more, twelve. Let's go to the row. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, 
11, one more, 12, well done, well done. So we're going to, uh, to crown it with a little abdominal workout. So we're going to do a few crunches, just like 12 times three, to make everything come together so that you feel tight together on your upper body. So let's go for the crunches, go on the ground, and we're tapping our, our knees times three. Okay, one, two, three, go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and right, twelve. We have a 30 seconds rest time. 30 seconds rest time. 30 seconds rest time. We put the timer. Right? That wasn't hard. That was easy. Easy and first. Yeah, we have 20 more seconds to go. 20 more seconds. 20 more seconds. We have 15 more seconds. You're doing well so far. We have 10 more seconds. Walk around if you can. We have five more seconds and let's position, get back to position, get back to position. There we go, let's go. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and one more, twelve. Let's go for the last set. We don't have to wait for the time for 30 seconds. You can do this. We can do this, right? Yes, we can. Let's go down. One, two, three. I know you're ready. <laughs> Let's go. One, two, three, go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11 and 12 well done well done you ran through it like a soldier you're starting your day on a new normal my name is Evelyn Oala and that's all we had for you for today until our next episode please watch out for Peter as he comes along with all that he has to bring to us in our next episode Signs of Anna. That man was nothing but a murderer. Yes, he was. I know that. You have no choice, Gina. No. You know what should be done. No. You should suffer the consequences of your actions. Anna Letitia killed Gina? No. I wouldn't let that happen. You sold your precious daughter for money, and this time you're doing the same thing with my husband. And if that woman keeps chasing after my husband, she will know exactly what I can do. And I don't care if we are sisters. I swear she will regret this. She'll see what a big mistake she has committed. The three sides of Anna. Finding the truth in these uncertain times has become certain. Possibilities for business even more convenient with the Nation e-paper. To enjoy this and more, simply dial star 550 star 1 hash for daily nation and star 550 star 5 hash for business daily on your mobile phone and get 50% discount on the e-paper. Yes, for just 20 shillings each, the truth will find you and more possibilities right where you are. Dial star 550 star 1 hash for daily nation and star 550 star 5 hash for business daily today terms and conditions apply 
let us continue to worship and pray as individuals and the families and our God will surely hear us as we act in obedience to the book of Isaiah 26:20. Go, my people, enter your rooms and shut the doors behind you. Hide yourselves for a little while until his wrath has passed by. This is NTV. Africa and welcome to your world. Now today is the 16th of June which marks the day of the African child where the world takes stock and promotes children's rights and highlights their welfare issues. Now I will be joined by some of the real VVIPs of the day who are the children and also stakeholders who are committed to having their voice heard. My name is Gladys Gashanja and this is what else you can expect on your world this Tuesday morning. Ministry of Labor and Social Protection launched the Day of the African Child with the theme Access to a Child-Friendly Justice System in Africa. But no one asks me what it feels like to be a child. Various children around Africa give their two cents on the Day of the African Child as they appreciate the African Children Charter that recognizes their rights. Away from that, chimp sanctuary owners are concerned as chimpanzees rescued from the forest are sheltered under strict lockdown orders for the last two months. And since large groups can no longer gather as a result of the coronavirus pandemic, students can take skill lifts to attend a graduation ceremony. Well, thank you for joining us on this broadcast and we take a look around the world and how those numbers are looking like in as far as the effects of COVID-19 are concerned and globally so far. 8,113,065 people have tested positive of COVID-19. Thankfully, 4 million of those 213,284 have totally recovered from the same. And unfortunately, we have lost 439,064 people to COVID-19. Now, right here in Kenya, so far, the government says we have 3,700. 727 confirmed cases of COVID-19, 1,286 people have recovered from the same and unfortunately 104 Kenyans have succumbed 
to COVID-19. Well, these are numbers that keep updating by the hour across the world. And of course, as you know, right here in Kenya, we have that daily briefing that tells us how the situation is on the ground right here in Kenya. Well. As I had highlighted earlier and alluded to our conversation of the day, the theme for this year's day of the African child is access to child friendly justice system. So our question of the day to you is what has been your experience accessing justice on behalf of a child who has been in conflict with the law or had their rights violated? What has been your experience with a child who has been in conflict with the law or has the, had their rights violated. Remember that hashtag new normal on any social media space and you can also call us or text us on that number on the bottom of your screen. And now let's look at some of the top stories making headlines even as we follow on the effects of COVID-19. For the first time, the government has publicly confirmed COVID-19 infections of its officials after State House stated its four officials have tested positive for coronavirus. In a brief statement to the media, State House spokesperson, that is Kanzer Dena, said the president and the first family are safe and free from COVID-19. And also Jane Goyri reports that ODM party, party leader, that Raila Odinga, received and accepted his COVID-19 results that are negative. The coronavirus crisis has infiltrated one of the country's most secured buildings. Four State House staff tested positive for the virus. State House spokesperson in a statement said the four cases were discovered during a mass testing that was conducted on Thursday. Now extra access protocols have been rolled out, especially for staff residing outside the compound and for visitors. The statement, however, allayed the country's fears, adding that the country's chief executive and his family are safe and sound. The infected officers are admitted at the Kenyatta University Teaching and Referral Hospital in Kiambu County, where they're undergoing treatment. State House says their families and close contacts have been traced and have been attended to accordingly. The House on the Hill has in the recent days been hosting a number of meetings attended by large crowds. This includes a Jubilee Party Parliamentary Group meeting where more than 100 people attended. In the meantime, ODM leader Raila Odinga, another high-ranking official, announced he had tested negative for the coronavirus. It is actually in each and every person's um, interest that they should know their status. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in, this, in the war against this uh, pandemic. Odinga said he had accepted the results and he displayed his clearance certificate and urged Kenyans to adhere to MOH safety guidelines. Jin Gweri, NTV. Now, different sectors in the government are slowly adjusting to the new normal and making the necessary changes to enable their operations to go on under the new circumstances that the globe finds itself in. The judiciary is the latest to scale up its operations by setting up more outdoor courts catering for all divisions at the High Court. NTV's Naoma Sampao has that story. The Milimani Law Courts, which is often a hive of activity, has in the past weeks been empty. But normalcy is slowly creeping in, just not the normal many were accustomed to. Tents to serve as makeshift courtrooms have been put up at the parking area. Each division of the court has its own tent, which is boldly labelled. On the benches, signs persuading court users to observe social distancing guidelines have also been put up. The patches of paintwork on the ground guided visitors to the court on how to keep a safe distance. Temperature checks at the gate were imperative. All visitors were required to provide personal details for ease of contact tracing. Hand washing stations had also been set up around the court premises. Courtrooms will now be admitting 15 people at a time, including the magistrate, members of staff, the defense and the prosecution, as well as the accused persons. Others have to wait in line on clearly marked sections within the court precincts. Don't worry, we are going to a lot. 
ndani 1 by 1 na kanikisha chini na unaelezwa kesi yako itakuja for mention siku fulani at the Bungoma Law Courts, the announcement that the courts will reopen attracted a huge crowd of residents seeking court services. Here, social distancing was just an idea. Some others were wearing their masks at half mast. Hapa Bungoma Mahakamani, naona shukuri si mzuri sana. Kwa sababu, nimeenda kwa mahakama zote, open courts, nimeona kwamba zimearenjua vizuri. Either way, those who are allowed through the gates had to be taken through the new order as the court struggles to clear the mounting pile of cases while enforcing safety guidelines. Nayoma Sampao, NTV. While the rising number of gender-based violence and sexual offences is posing a significant concern during this COVID-19 pandemic, children are not being spared. The Ministry of Labour and Social Protection launched the Day of the African Child with a theme access to a child-friendly justice system in Africa. This will see all agencies dealing with children in the justice system have synergy to curb cases of injustices. Clear procedures will guarantee the children a dignified and fair process of justice when their rights are usurped. With the ongoing pandemic, children are also being trained on court procedures and seating arrangements while being sensi sensitized on safety measures put in place by the courts. of children's services to ensure that children going through the system are sensitized about COVID-19 pandemic and how to protect themselves from it. We also request that more messages on child-friendly justice be circulated to homes and communities, highlighting contacts that the households can use to report cases of child abuse and neglect. We call on the judiciary to have a child-friendly pamphlet to explain what the child justice system is to children. We also call on this arm of government to ensure that children are brief and trained on how virtual courts work. And definitely that kickstarts our conversation this morning, even as we focus on the day of the African child with that theme again, access to a child-friendly justice system. To help us have this conversation is Juliet Nyambura, who is a child rights advocate and a technical advisor for the NCAJ Special Task Force on Children uh, Matters, and she will be telling us what exactly they are tasked to do. We have uh, Pauline Kedogo Anubi, who is an advocacy manager at the SOS Children's Villages right here in Kenya. We also are joined virtually by Lillian Zodzo, who is the National Director, Wild Vision Kenya, and she will be giving us a scope of how children in the marginalized areas are being catered for. And of course, we have Dr. Nkatha Murungi, who is the head of the Child and Law Program at the African Child Policy Forum, and she is based in South Africa. And of of course, as you can see right next to Nkatha, we have the boy child represented, and that is Billy Omondi. He is a member of the Kisumu County Children Assembly, and of course, he joins us as also a child rights activist. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, and I'll start off with you, Juliet. Of course, everyone is wondering, the Day of the African Child, why do we even celebrate it in the first place? Well, good morning, um, and thank you very much for having this um, special occasion to, you know, to celebrate the African child. Um, and so we celebrate the Day of the African Child in commemoration of children who were discriminated upon in South Africa. And you know what is amazing is that this is actually a very opportune time, um, going by the uh, conversation that is going on in the world uh, about Black Lives Matter. Um, these children actually refused to be discriminated on uh, and they took to the streets. And so this day is in commemoration of, of these children. Um, and, um, and you can imagine that the OAU set up this day to celebrate the children. And we can say that since 1976, we have seen tremendous growth in access to justice for children. We have seen um, child rights grow in Africa. So this is not just a celebration for Kenya, it is a celebration all over the world. And uh, we're talking about the theme being access to a child-friendly justice system. Yeah. What does that mean? Wow, that's a very, um, I, when I think about it, um, it's, it's, it's multifaceted when you talk about 
justice. So, you know, there's uh, different components of it. So there is the access bit, there is a justice bit, mm -hmm. and then there's a child-friendly justice. So, um, and, and the child-friendly justice system, uh, you know, we, we are supposed to break it down into components. For instance, there's a the part of infrastructure, there is a part of practice, there is a part of um, the laws and the legislation and the policies that's around um, the, uh, the, the child friendliness of the justice system mm -hmm. and then now there is the question of access to this system um, and uh, and so what are the many ways that children can access justice is that even possible mm -hmm. uh, so to speak uh, as an advocate uh, of about 10 years now I have not I don't have a conclusive answer as to whether this justice system is really accessible to children I can say that I have seen improvement uh, in the justice, in the accessibility of it to children. But um, as to certainly whether it is accessible is a discussion, is a very long conversation that we need to keep having. Um, and I'm happy that this day the African Committee of Experts actually said we are going to be looking at establishing um, the child friendliness um, of a justice system for children. And maybe you can define to us what entails the justice system. Of what It sounds like the judiciary, mm -hmm. but there is more to this than that. Right. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh -huh. So the thing I want, because I want to, to make it, uh, I'm also a lecturer, so I, I don't want to, to make it a legal class yeah. um, so that everyone can be able to understand. Mm -hmm. The justice system uh, has various facets. So you want to think about when a child has committed a crime or a child uh, needs help, Mm -hmm. from other uh, from beyond the parents um you know and and guardians where does the child run to so we have various facets so first probably if a child is lost in the streets they'll probably be taken to the police station mm -hmm. um or they'll be taken to the chief's office then after that the child will be taken to court in the process between court be, between the, the the say the chief's office and the police station and the court there are various people that the child comes into contact with mm -hmm. we have the department of children's services we have the uh, probation serv services sometimes we have the the volunteer children uh, volunteer children officers sometimes so we have various uh, people that a child comes into contact with um, should it be a criminal case, the child will come into contact with the Office of the uh, Directorate of Public Prosecution. Uh -huh. um, and so therefore, this entire system needs to be accessible to the child, it mm -hmm. needs to be friendly to the child. And then we have to ask ourselves, if the child is in court, what is happening? So if the child is a victim uh, of, a, of a crime, for instance, what kind of support do they need? Do they need um, legal support? Do they need counseling support? So mm -hmm. these are people that the child is coming into contact yeah. with this whole time. When the child exits the system, who does he or she meet? So that is what comprises of an entire justice system. And that is what we call, uh, for us in the task force of the juvenile justice, we call them the juvenile justice actors. These are the various offices and institutions that are put together to take care of the child that the child is going through the justice system. Okay, well said. Now we have the definition of the day, why the theme is as such, and what exactly entails the judicial system when it comes to the children. Let's bring in uh, the SOS villages. Now, these have been in Kenya for a while. Pauline, what can you tell us is the mandate of the SOS villages in as far as child protection is concerned? Um, uh, okay, thank you, Gladys, for the question, and uh, it's good to be here today. SOS Children's Villages Kenya is involved in various initiatives uh, within the community, and uh, we work uh, in collaboration with the government and other actors at a national level and at a county level as well. Uh, our mandate uh, is also drawn with uh, our co collaboration with the Department of Children's Services, the National Council for Children's Services, amongst other players. In, uh, in uh, ensuring that we continue to do our work, uh, we also uh, support the uh, processes of ensuring that uh, we advocate for child-friendly policies 
Uh, for example, we've been involved in uh, ensuring that uh, uh, the children's bill, voices of children have been uh, gotten into the processes of a children's bill. We also work uh, very closely to build the capacities of uh, different players within uh, the community. We have the law enforcement agencies, we have the judicial officers, we have the court users committees amongst others. And uh, we also promote uh, child participation initiatives as well. We work very closely with our child rights clubs, uh, building their capacities to ensure that they are aware of their rights. Uh, we also work with uh, government structures such as the uh, children's assemblies at the county and even at the national level, just to ensure that well the voices of children are heard and are uh, respected. We also um, work uh, to support families within the communities in our program intervention areas where we have our family strengthening programs. And uh, we support these families with uh, um, livelihoods, access to basic needs and uh, other rights such as food, just to cushion them from the uh, 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 rising uh, cases of poverty. Uh, and also to support our work, we are working uh, jointly with the Joining Forces for Children Alliance. This is an initiative made up of the big six organizations, SOS, World Vision, uh, Plan Kenya, TDH, and uh, Save the Children Kenya. So we've come together to collaborate just to confirm the commitment uh, by government towards ensuring the progressive re realization of the rights of children. And uh, in so working, we've been advocating for uh, specific initiatives uh, such as um, budget allocation for children programs just to ensure that the systems that uh, Jennifer was actually uh, 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 the system that Juliet was actually talking about are working well, efficiently, and effectively. We also work uh, collaboratively uh, to ensure that uh, we safeguard the rights of children within our program uh, intervention areas, which means that we put the child at the center of all our programs and uh, just to ensure that these children are protected and in case there is any form of violation, a way to mitigate and also ensure that uh, we provide an environment where they can seek justice and also for their rights to be uh, fully uh, ensured within the spaces we work. So as SOS, those are some of the programs that we have and uh, we also ensure alternative uh, parenting to children within our uh, Children Villages program in the eight uh, locations we 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 are um, engaged in. Thank, Thank you, you, Pauline. Now we have a better scope of what SOS villages do in Kenya. Now th let's bring in the world vision. And uh, Lilian Zozo is now joining us. She's the national director there. What part do you play in child protection? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody, and go good morning, my fellow panelists. Uh, World Vision is a child-focused um, national, uh, national NGO ensure the protection of children's rights. We also focus, um, as my predecessors have uh, indicated, in ensuring that children, as they are living in the communities, are protected and they have access to any, any form of protection that ensures their well-being. We also work in the area of access to children's rights, such as education, nutrition, making sure that children really enjoy life in all its fullness. Um, there has been an increasing challenge as, as we've been working, especially in the marginalized areas where World Vision is present, like for example in refugee camps in Kakuma and Dadab, where we are seeing quite a number of vulnerable children being excluded from um, their rights, uh, rightful access to education, for instance, rightful access to nutrition, and rightful access to other services that they are entitled to. So our work is really to ensure that we go to those hard to reach areas to make sure that children are catered for and we provide programs working with communities through community empowerment, mm -hmm. working with assistant chiefs, working with counties, as well as 
national government, um, as Pauline indicated, you know, the National Council of Children's Services, the National Council of Administration of Justice, the Ministry of Labor and Social Protection Services, really advocating to make sure that no child is left behind and ensuring that those that are also in vulnerable zones are catered for in terms of their needs and their rights to certain basic services. So our work really encompasses, uh, we cover 37 counties, uh, here in Kenya, where we really focus on community-based um, uh, interventions that seek to address the issue of children's rights. Okay. And uh, Dr. Nkata, you are based in uh, South Africa and you have a better scope of the region, even as we emphasize on the access to a friendly uh, justice system for the children. How does that look like from a regional point of view? Thank you. Good morning, brothers. Good morning, colleagues. Um, I, I, am, I speak from a Pan-African perspective, mostly because that is the area in which I work in. Um, I think this is a very timely conversation on the African continent, because just as we are having um, the discussion within Kenya, the rest of the continent, we are taking stock of how much has changed. And I think um, one of the main things that I would say in terms of having a Pan-African picture is that at least this year, we have 30 years since the adoption of the African Charter on the Rights and Wealth mm -hmm. of the Child. Yeah. It's also um, about 31 years since the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. So we really have had time and conversations around access to justice. So a lot has changed on the African continent, um, which I would say mostly at least at least at the legal and policy uh, level mm -hmm. we have more laws we have more national instruments and we are able to speak to those so i think um from a general point of view i it's encouraging uh, the picture across the continent however most african countries still have a long way to go to say that we have you know an effective legal protection for the right to access justice for children um, and the other thing maybe to say is that increasingly we are talking about having common standards or harmonizing our standards across from country to country. So we, we might not be you know, able to rank them from number one to number 55 of African countries, but we are in a position to say that clearly a lot has improved. Um, and I think as we go on in the course of the conversation, yes. I might be able to share some experiences from specific countries that have done uh, pretty well, I think. Definitely. We'll be delving into the best practices in the region. And as you can see, the young man right next to Nkata is Billy, and uh, he is part of the Children Assembly. Billy, you are the real VVIP of this day. We celebrate you. Tell us more about the Children Assembly. What does it do? Billy, can you hear me? Okay, good morning, everyone. In the children's assembly. Okay. Keep going, keep going. Okay, we seem to be can happy. You? Yes, he can hear us. Keep going, Billy. Okay. Okay, children's assembly. It's a system whereby the children are given the opportunity to rule themselves, govern themselves, and share out their issues to various to various systems of the government. Like the children also have their own system of government. For example, we have the speaker who can speak on behalf of the children, like from the county level or from the national level. And I think this is a very good thing to have because no one can speak on behalf of the children. Thank you. Very well said. And maybe you can give us an idea of how you constitute those children assemblies. Okay. For, for the system to be constituted, there's always an election. An election must be, must be done from the children themselves. Mm -hmm. After the elections have been done, um, uh, you'll be voted in. There will be a panel that will be in charge of teaching you on how to govern, how to govern your fellow children. And uh, 
how to rule them wisely. Secondly, mm -hmm. we'll be attending various meetings that will be giving information on how to be a good leader and keep you smart in the system. That's how they've been constituted. Okay, and what is your role in the child assembly? What's your position? I'm the speaker of Kisumu County. Well done, well done. And thank you for gracing us with your presence, Mr. Speaker, sir, from Kisubu County. And uh, another VVIP that is joining us is actually Monica, not her real name. And uh, she joins us from a statutory institution. She has been in conflict with the law, but she's undergoing rehabilitation. Monica, ulifikaje ukashikwa na ukaenda ukaekwa kwenye rehab center? Okay, mimi nimezaliwa na watoto sita. Mhm. Yes. Ehe, nakusikia, endelea. Tukalelewa na wazazi wote wawili. After a while, baba aka divorce na mamangu. Mama akachukuana na baba wa Kambo. Tukaanza kuishi tu kama kawaida. Ikafika mahali baba wa Kambo akaanza kuleta time waliza na mamangu mtoto mmoja akaanza kwa akaanza ku, kuonyesha ubaguzi sasa kuonyesha ubaguzi mimi hata waki nikasikia wakigombana kwa nyumba na mamangu nikisikiliza Nik, kenye walikuwa naongelelea ni kuhusu sisi wenye tuko nyuma ya wenye ni wazazi watoto wa baba mwenye waliachana na yeye mm -hmm. sasa mimi kusikia hivyo nikaanza kujichukia hadi nasikia anasema tim Nasikia anasema kama umeshindwa kukaa na mimi uchukue watoto upeleke kwao kwa baba yao. Mhm. Mm Sasa nikaona maisha yakiwa magumu. The nilikuwa at that moment nilikuwa bado nasoma but maisha ilikuwa tu ya ku struggle. Tulikuwa tunategemea mzazi mmoja. Mhm. Mm Sasa hata kusoma ilikuwa ni ngumu cause school fees haipatikani. Hata chakula ilikuwa inapatikana enough. Mhm. Sasa mimi nikafika class 5 nikaona maisha yakiwa magumu sana cuz wenye watu wako juu yangu wa, wali drop shule hakuna mwenye amepita class 5 Sa, na mimi nikaona maisha bado ni magumu na sitaweza kuvumilia nikaamua kwenda kwenye wako hata sijui kwenye wako nikaamua kwenda kujitafutia pia mimi nipate chakula Sa, katika katika harakati za kutafuta chakula town moja nikashikwa na afisa Sa, kushiku nikapiga police station kupela kwa huko wakaniuliza kama nina wazazi nikawapea namba ya mzazi mm -hmm. wakamuita kumuita wakamuuliza nini mbaya na mimi wakasema yeye ako na watoto wengi ana anachunga sio mm -hmm. peke yangu saka kuna place naweza pelekwa nipate masomo kwa zato ana struggle hata mm -hmm. wengine hawasomi mhm mm akasema kama kuna place naweza pelekwa nisome nitakuwa mm -hmm. sawa saka ambua hakuna venye naweza pelekwa kama sijapitia jazi sijapitia kotini. Ah. Nikapelekwa nika kotini. Mhm. Mm Nikaambua niende nikaambua niende Rumand. Kwenda Rumand nilikuwa naenda tu mention mention kama miezi mbili. Ndio siku ya mwisho nikaenda kotini wakaniambia na nafaa niende miaka tatu kirigiti. Nafaa niende miaka tatu rehabilitation school. Mhm. Mm eh nikaenda huko na ni sai so ni kule uko hata saa hii eh yeah okay uh, tutarudia pia ukini, utueleze vile maisha yamekuwa ama wakati huo ambapo ulipitia kotini na pia polisi utuambie experience yako ilikuwa vipi now when you listen to that experience Juliet and the reason why i needed Monica not her real name to speak to us is so that you can give us an idea of the kind of children that uh, find themselves in the system clearly not only those that are you know at crossroads with the law there are other circumstances like hers which are those um first of all thank you monica for your courage to you know tell us your story um and her story confirms one of the things that as a task force we realized um last year 
So for the last three years, if you allow me, I'll, I'll go s slightly into the work of the task force. Um, and, I'll, and I'll also allow the, the Chief Justice, I mean, sorry, not Chief Justice, but Justice Martha Kome, who will be joining us later to explain a little bit further. But one of the tasks we are given is to sort of look at the institutions um, where the children are placed. Mm -hmm. And we call them child-holding uh, institutions. And when we went into those institutions, we made a, a not very good discovery that out of uh, f uh, all the children who are placed in the re rehabilitation center, so that means it's like... Um, you know, it's where the children get to spend the most, to serve their time, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, that 4% uh, of the children who are there are the only ones who need to be in that rehabilitation center. Those are the only ones who are in conflict with the law. The other children are like Monica, who really are children in need of care and protection as it is stipulated within the Children's Act. So the Children's Act, what it does is that it talks about, I think Section 119, about children who are in need of care and protection. It lists out about um, 15 or so categories of children who, who are in need of care and protection. Mm -hmm. These are children who are lost, children who um, are delinquents, uh, so to speak, children who are victims of abuse, children who are in the streets, um, children like Monica who really need not be in the system in the first place. Yeah. What they have so she's spending three years in the rehabilitation center she spent about three months uh, waiting for her case to progress yes. we do not know how long she stayed in the in the streets before the uh, officers picked her up so i can see that this is a child whose life unfortunately i'm going to say this is almost being wasted uh, away while they're supposed to be in school just because the parents uh, did not have um, you know, the, the finances, for instance, yes. to put her up in school or to feed her, according to her story. So this confirms that not all children belong to the justice system. But how do children find their way into the, into the system? Um, so one is a child who can be a victim of abuse, as mm -hmm. I said. Unfortunately, we live in a society uh, where children, because of their vulnerability, find themselves in very uh, dangerous situations. I have uh, had the unfortunate chance to walk with a child who is a victim of sexual abuse, and there are many. And uh, and you can read various reports, even one of the reports of the ta the report of the task force that tells you just the, the huge numbers of sexual offences against children. Um, you, there are also children who find themselves in with uh, in contact with the law because they are victims of physical abuse, uh, parental neglect, like is the case of Monica, um, and other cases. The other kind of, uh, the other category of children, as I said, is children now who are in need of care and protection. And, um, you know, these are children who generally maybe they're not, probably they're not victims, uh, they are not uh, in conflict with the law, but they are in contact, they're, they need of care and protection. And also because sometimes their parents um, cannot, do not seem to agree. Yeah. So they find themselves uh, in court either um, when the parents are fighting uh, for custody or maintenance, and sometimes their voice has to be heard in, in court. Um, and then finally, there's the category of children who are in conflict with the law. So these are children who have clearly um, you know, gone against the law. They have committed uh, certain offenses that require them to face the justice system. Okay, now Pauline, clearly the corona pandemic has actually exacerbated the situation, especially in as far as uh, what uh, Juliet is actually describing here. What has been your experience? Pauline, can you hear me? Um, please come again. Uh, the corona pandemic definitely has exacerbated the situation in as far as violations against children and even those that are coming in conflict with the law. What are those that you've seen during this season? Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, there's an increasing number of uh, cases of abuse uh, related to children. Uh, one of them being sexual abuse and uh, physical abuse. Uh, we've also heard of cases where there's ongoing FGM uh, within the community and also children are being married off at a very young age during this period of time. And then uh, because of the circumstances that families uh, find themselves in and parents are not able to provide the basic needs that uh, their children need, we find some children who are actually begging on the streets. Uh, take a small drive across uh, the street and you'll find uh, a number of children who are begging just to be able to put food on the table. And we also have those other ones who are um, exposed to older men perhaps. Uh, for the young girls who are exposed to 
older men uh, for sexual favors in return of maybe some financial kind of support. So all these forms of abuse are taking place during this pandemic because of the um, increased uh, number of poverty perhaps within the community because families are not able to provide for themselves. But we also have, uh, based on the fact that we have children uh, using the online platform such as the mobile phones and uh, computers uh, to engage in school learning programs, we also find cases where these children are exposed to pornography, access to sites where they are not actually supposed to be engaging with adults for uh, child pornography. So these cases are uh, presenting themselves in uh, different ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also find that uh, uh, during this period of time, uh, as we continue to discuss the, pande the pandemic and how it's affecting children, there are cases of also conflict within the communities where they might be uh, trying to come up with means to support the communities so that they are able to get some kind of resilience and uh, get the families uh, being able to be cushioned. Thank you, Pauline. Now, Lillian, when we think about the urban, rural, and marginalized areas, are those things that Pauline is talking about uh, common in all these areas or each carries its own weight? Absolutely. They are common in both urban and rural areas. If you look at urban informal settlements, uh, for instance, in those areas too, where families have lost their income due to COVID-19 because they are employed in the informal sector, where restrictions have been put in place in terms of uh, closure of markets, job losses, and things like that, it really has aggravated uh, injustices on children because, as you know, poverty really can accelerate injustices on children. So you find that there are increasing cases of child abuse, even in urban informal settlements. There's increasing, increasing cases of child exploitation. Children right now are out of school as their families have lost yeah. income. It's not even clear whether they'll be able to find their way back to school. There'll be a lot of school dropouts. There are a lot of young girls also getting pregnant early. Mm -hmm. That too could cause them to drop out of school. And then if you go into the rural settlements, as Pauline has indicated, uh, we as the Joining Alliance um, uh, uh, in Kenya, Joining Forces Alliance in Kenya, have established that there's also an increase in FGM cases as children are confined at home and are not going to school. Some children as well, you know, the only source of nutrition that they were getting was, for example, through the school feeding program. So as schools are closed, they don't have access to that right now. So there's also increasing cases of malnutrition. There's also increasing cases of child labor. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at pastoralist communities with children now available at home, there are more children, boy children now going for cattle herding and all sorts of activities, girl children doing extra labor, subjected to child labor, so that they can also supplement uh, the income at home. So a lot of child protection injustices are ongoing uh, because of COVID-19, both in the urban sectors as well as um, in, the, in, the, in the rural sectors. And we as Joining Forces Alliance in Kenya, working in collaboration, as Pauline indicated, with SOS, Children's Villages, Plan International in Kenya, Save the Children, Tedezom and Child Fund, along with World Vision, are really advocating for a more coordinated um, response to child protection issues, uh, whether it's at national, county, or at community level, to make sure that really systems become strengthened so that there's public awareness in terms of how to report um, those child protection abuses, those child abuses, and also how they can be handled. There's need for increased awareness and a coordinated effort so that there are also some standard uh, protocols or guidelines that are put in place that enable communities, even at household level, to understand how to ably report such cases. Now, Unkata, you are in South Africa, one of the African countries that has been adversely affected by COVID-19. Maybe you can give us an example of how it looks like for a country like that for the children. Thank you, Gladys. Um, so COVID-19 has uh, made, it, in a way, equalized societies. Um, so, you know, we don't have as much as you'd think uh, many so much differences from country to country. Mm -hmm. And in as far as access to justice is concerned, I think one of the things that uh, is becoming more and more apparent is that most African countries, including South Africa, did not really think through 
um, the views of children or how children would be affected by the conflict, by, by sorry, by the pandemic. And so in practice, what has been happening is that the NGOs, the non-governmental organizations and institutions dealing with children have had to be, you know, running behind government policy mm -hmm. and calling for sensitivity to the needs of children in this period. And basically saying that even though we are going, you know, we are, we are going to be closed, it does not mean that during this pandemic we will be um, you know, we, we will be ignoring the plight of children. So specifically, that court should still remain accessible to children during pandemic this period. But secondly, one of the things that has a reason is that the pandemic has exposed, um, uh, you know, or amplified some of the problems that children experience when they are confined to uh, spaces with adults, particularly if they are in an abusive household. Mm -hmm. So the cases of domestic violence have really um, spiked. Uh, South Africa has recorded, for instance, uh, an increase in cases of domestic violence, particularly in the first few days of the, the hard lockdown, because um, unlike Kenya, for instance, South Africa had a very strict lockdown. We were uh, housebound for 21 days. Now it's almost 70 something days. Yes. And during this period, it makes it very hard for children uh, to, if they're experiencing uh, violence at home, for instance, to reach out to, to access justice. So one of the things that has happened is that there is, of course, campaigns, there's media campaigns, there's um, campaigns by non-governmental organizations to highlight avenues through which children can still access justice institutions that uh, provide uh, you know legal aid and representation for children have been very active to mm -hmm. be able to um, present cases when they come up but also it it has now become the 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 good thing is that it's become now central to the discussion with government that you must really think through consequences for children when you make the policy mm -hmm. uh, for most children on the african continent school is a safe space and uh, we, we, we don't quite see that most of the time uh, the first point of contact for children will be teachers. They are the ones who notice that this child is probably being abused at home or this child is without food at home yeah. or this child is not coming to school and therefore maybe there's something wrong. So just removing the, the, the first instinct of the pandemic, you know, bringing an end to schooling was one of the things that probably was very consequential for children's protection. Um, yeah, so that is really some experiences from South Africa, but from what we have been doing uh, at, at the Center for Human Rights where I work, we have been noticing that this trend is not just in South Africa, it's in most of the other countries that went through the lockdown uh, approach to dealing with the pandemic. Okay, and uh, let's hear from Billy. Billy, this has been a, a very interesting time for all, and children, as we have said, have been very vulnerable. In Kisumu County, what are the challenges children have been facing? Okay, as for me, the challenges that children have been facing in Kisumu County, one of them is lack of information and awareness. You find like, and poverty. You find like most girls are being impregnated because of poverty. They are searching for food. If they are in school, maybe they could be getting that lunch. Mm -hmm. And secondly, lack of information. Yes. Okay, we seem to have lost belief for just a moment, but he brings up quite a very critical issue there in as far as poverty is concerned. And of course, he represents Kisumu County. But as we wait on Billy, I'd like to hear from Monica. Remember, she this is not her real name and uh, she is in a statutory uh, institution. Monica, you said ulikuwa kwenye kotini, ulipitia kotini miezi tatu. Sasa, you're facing three years kwa rehabilitation center. Iyo experience ulipitia. Ni vitu vipi hau kupenda? Okay. The challenges I faced in the justice system mm -hmm. were being treated like adults themselves, being put together with adults, lack of friendly language in courts, e.g. coming in the judge akisema, 
atika naombi nikaambiwa afunge macho tuombe nikatolewa hapo na polisi I was staying in police cells and the remand home mm -hmm. no toilets in cells harassment in remand and cells the rudeness of the police officers sleeping on a cold floor mm. whenever you raise your I raised my hand in court you are told that the time is over Mm -hmm. Misunderstanding your cases, being beaten without a reason. Okay, and all this happened in your quest to access justice. Now, that definitely ties into our conversation today, Juliet. And I would like to know what has the pandemic probably even exacerbated or made the situation worse? Because those are some of the issues that children face on a daily. Yes, um, unfortunately, that's why uh, when, when we talk about the child-friendly justice system, mm -hmm. I'm insisting that there is beyond infrastructure, there is also the practice, there is the language, there is the, uh, you know, just how we treat children. There was actually a report that was released um, a couple of years ago uh, by an organization called Chesby that looked at the violence that children uh, suffer uh, through the justice system. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gory report. It's not a, a, a good report to read, especially concerning children. Uh, imagining that a child, when they walk into the police station, the first thing they meet is uh, a uniformed police officer. And uh, I mean, we've all had experiences walking into police stations. Mm. They're not the most friendliest places ever, even if you know a police officer. Uh, so you can imagine when a child walks in there, if it's a child who is in conflict with the law or if it's a child victim. In fact, we had situations where child victims would walk into the, into the police station to report cases of sexual uh, abuse and they would be told, go and discuss it at home, you know, or they would laugh at you. So for instance, if one of the things that Monica is saying is that she was treated like an adult. So you, rea you find that um, in those in, uh, institutions or, ju or justice systems yeah. that... They, they look at the child and say, Uyo ni mrefu sana, uyo ni mkubwa sana. So they uh -huh. immediately think you're an adult until an age assessment is done. Um, so the, the, the conversation of the child friendliness of a justice system goes beyond. Just to answer your question, um, COVID has obviously exacerbated the situation now because um, first of all, there is delay in cases. So if there's a child right now in remand, um, the cases were not going on for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and until, you know, the courts decided, okay, we, we have to come up with an innovative ways to make sure that these cases are hard. Um, also, I would really like to applaud the, the DPP, uh, where they made a decision to divert a lot of the cases of children. So that when a child comes into the system uh, currently, they do not have to wait at the police station, uh, you know, whether to wait for their case to be processed. The office of the DPP will actually sit down, look through the case and recommend that the cases are diverted unless they really need to go through the process, especially where children are in conflict with the law, those cases will be diverted. And for that, I just want to say thank you to the office of the DPP. What do you uh, mean by diversion? That. So let me uh, explain a little bit uh, further on what diversion is. Diversion is a concept where a child does not go through the justice system at all. Um, uh, um, let me just go back a little bit. A child-friendly justice system ensures that a child does not come into the system at all. That is what the Un United Convention on the Rights of the Child, mm -hmm. that's what the African Charter on the Rights of the, and the Welfare of the Child, that's what our Constitution and that is what our Children Act says, that a, that a child needs, need not come into the justice system mm -hmm. in the first place at all. And so they need to only come into contact with it even only when it is necessary. So... When we divert, we mean that we, we are trying to make sure that this child does not come into the harmful uh, nature of what our justice system is. Because, and the reports will show, that for every process that a child goes through, they come out a different person. They are psychologically affected, their education is affected, their lives generally uh, are affected. Mm -hmm. So with diversion, what we are advocating for, the Office of the DPP, the Task Force on Children Matters, one of the things we're advocating for is saying we must divert cases of children and um, especially child offenders. We must find a way of having the community rehabilitate them. Mm -hmm. Gladys, you will agree with me. Now, for a child to commit an offense, something is wrong with our system. It's not really the, the, the fault of the child if you look at it it we have a role to play in bringing up this child properly but we are finding that children like Monica um, is in the justice system because she didn't have 
uh, food, she didn't have uh, education, you know, and just because the parents are not able to provide this, that means that the government also is not seeing mm -hmm. this child. Yes. And that is why the child is in the system. So if we can find a way to make sure that this child goes back into the into this community and have the child rehabilitated within the community, it is a safer place because it is protective. Um, because it is it is home. It is what the child knows. It is what is conducive and like going through the justice system. So obviously as COVID has exacerbated the situation, but as I said, the DPP are doing something about it. The courts as well um, are, are, you know, coming up with virtual ways of hearing children, especially cases of, uh, you know, defilement cases where, where children are victims of abuse. Uh, so where we, um, again, the DCI through the Child Protection Unit, the Anti-Human Trafficking Child Protection Unit, uh, they're using you know the, the virtual systems to be able to record evidence of a child and the child mm -hmm. now can testify virtually without necessarily actually sitting in, in, in court um, and, and hearing the, the case. So that is something else that is very commendable during this time. The children are also receiving um, teletherapy so that uh, they can receive counseling. As I said, one of the things that we need to establish within the child-friendly justice system is a system that also heals the child. Uh -huh. It's a system that is all round. So if the child must get into the system, can we ensure that the child comes out of that system healed? If what took them there in the first place was lack of food, can we ensure that we deal with that so the child does not reoffend? Because as uh, Justice Gomez likes to say, the child has only 18 years to live. Um, and then after that, they become adults. So if that child walks into the system when they are nine years old or 10 years old, and they have to spend two years in a case, um, you know, and then another three years in remand, surely we are definitely wasting their time. And that is why we are really advocating for diversion of the cases of children. Well, the conversation today, the day of the African child theme, as we have mentioned, is access to a child-friendly justice system. Now, even as we celebrate the children of Africa and 30 years of the African Children Charter that recognizes children's rights, interests, and most of all, recommit to an African feed for all, we see a few children from different parts of Africa giving their two cents on being an African child. People love to ask me what I want to be when I grow up. But no one asks me what it feels like to be a child. Sometimes my brothers don't want to play with me. It makes me sad, but my coco always tells me that family is important. What happens during the early years is crucial for every child's development. It is a period of great opportunity, but also of vulnerability to negative influence. My family did this for me by making sure I have good nutrition, health consisting, loving and care, and encouragement to learn in my early years. Speaking of family, my father has been making sure I do my homework and that I practice reading and writing every day. He says that education will take me far. Article 11 of the African Charter on the Rights and Welfare of, of the Child says that every child has the right to an education. On any given school day, over 1 billion children around the world head to school. Yet, for many of them, schooling does not always lead to learning. Experts have called this a learning crisis, and I agree. Without proper investment made in education, we will look back and realize that children have been left behind. Education matters. I love my family and friends. Whenever I'm sad, they can always make me feel better. They care about my mental and physical well-being. That makes me feel safe. Nous avons le droit d'être protégés dans nos communautés, nos familles et nos écoles. Mais dans de nombreux cas, nous ne demandons pas d'aide parce que nous pensons qu'une menace pour notre sécurité et de notre faute n'est pas un problème. Je sais comment nous pouvons tous agir et changer cela pour le mieux. Les gouvernements doivent faire des lois qui accordent de la priorité à notre protection. Les organisations de protection des enfants devraient offrir autant de soutien que possible pour s'assurer que le problème des enfants reste à l'autre du jour. Nos familles peuvent nous protéger de la violence physique et psychologique en nous encourageant à prendre la parole et à lutter contre les normes sociales qui nuisent aux enfants. Question de sécurité. Nous 
we are the future. Please treat us like the future that matters. That would be an African fit for me. Africa! Thank you for watching. Clearly, as I call them, the little humans have a say in as far as how they'd like to be treated and how they view actually a health a healthy life to so to speak even as they grow in society now we take a short break right here on your world when we return you and i have seen on the news some very disturbing cases of children caught up in custody cases and we'll be looking at how their rights are actually violated even as the parents are pulling and tugging stay with us Finding the truth in these uncertain times has become certain. Possibilities for business even more convenient with the Nation e-paper. To enjoy this and more, simply dial star 550 star 1 hash for daily nation and star 550 star 5 hash for business daily on your mobile phone and get 50% discount on the e-paper. Yes, for just 20 shillings each, the truth will find you and more possibilities right where you are. Dial star 550 star 1 hash for daily nation and star 550 star 5 hash for business daily today terms and conditions apply don't be nervous anna just look at the picture acknowledge that you look like her but you have to insist that you're not her that woman looks nothing like my wife here then how come we don't know you don't let your nerves get the best of you what if they ask me something i can't answer it's taught in acting class if you don't know the answer or you don't want to answer it, throw the question back to them. Stop wasting your time trying to prove that she's Anna. I want you to find out all the information there is to know about Stella Guerrero. Everything about her. Kuanda mana na mama kienda clinic na pia kujua hali yako ya HIV ni muhimu. Inaonyesha unamjali na pia unajali mtoto wako mtarajiwa. Je, unajijua? Afya bora, maisha bora. Jipime, jinue. Mining, a key driver of employment opportunities in the country. A major source of export revenue for Kenya. And with birding prospects in the oil sector, a vital pillar of the country's economic diversification. This Tuesday, Business Redefined digs into what lies ahead for the mining sector in the coming financial year. Amar Sanitizer is an alcohol-based sanitizer containing ethanol which has a broad spectrum antimicrobial activity killing bacteria, viruses and fungi. Amar Sanitizer is enriched with aloe vera making it gentle on your hands. Thank you. 
Good morning and thank you for staying with your world. My name is Gladys Gashanda and today the 16th of June we celebrate the Day of the African Child. The theme for this year is access to a child-friendly justice system and we've had amazing conversations even as we try to understand where the gaps are in as far as accessing this friendly justice system for the kids and uh, even as we think about this system let's come a bit closer home and how the family and the justice system actually walk hand in hand to protect the child. Now, the viral video of a nine-year-old child clinging to her father and rejecting her mother at the Mwingi Law Courts in a custodial case was blown out of proportion. Well, this was according to the judiciary, which now says that both parents were granted equal legal custody. A statement from the judiciary father notes that all matters of interest were conversed before a competent, competent court, rather, given that the child actually lives with her paternal grandparents. Contrary to what uh, the judiciary said in their statement, uh, there's actually an application that was filed on 10th of January 2020, seeking to review. And this is another case where the mother was actually granted custody of her four children, but the children refused to go with her, saying she abandoned them when she, they were very young. The last born was four years old and is now four years old. And the mother only left at when she was a few months and the father had this to say. The mother who left them three years, about three years ago, and now today I have just brought the children. She left them about three years ago. The, the smallest, alikuwa na nyonya. Mi mwenye ni memlea na daipa, hata hakuwa na jua kuongea, hakuwa na jua kuenda cho. Sahi, she's a school going girl. Ni mtoto mkubwa. Hata hamjui yeye. Hajui yu mwenye aliwaacha, ali, alimuacha. So, uh, na, na, I think that's the why umeona wame react hapa, wame mkata. Misi kwa na option nyingine. I'll just go back to court and tell the magistrate when you wame react. Si na option nyingine. The order, uh, I, I think they were served by, by that lady, by Grace, who left the children. They were served uh, by Grace. So today they came and they have confirmed. They were telling me to let the children out. I have let them, I have told them to get out of the car. They have sticked on my side. They have not gone to, to Grace. So, me, Sinashinda, Sinashinda. Actually, if I can be very sincere, our watoto ni jaribu mpaka ye mwenye. Complete na yeye. Nikamuadikia messages, nikamuadikia mpaka WhatsApp messages, nikamuambia kuje, aribod na watoto. Akakata na akakata. Have the evidences of the messages, I've presented them to court, and because the matter is in court, sita hiko into details, wacha nao koti huko kuingine iedere. I respect the court. So sita kikuongea sana kusui kesi. And these are just examples of many cases that are out there that never make it to the high headlines. And the question here is, Pauline, even as the children are going through the justice system in the first place, in such a case when it has to do with custody, should the children be involved to actually voice what they think should be the best arrangement for them? Um, uh, yes, uh, Gladys, the participation of children in all matters that uh, concern them is very important. And uh, in the field of uh, child protection and uh, child rights, it's very important to appreciate that uh, children development at different stages and they express themselves uh, based on those developmental milestones. So even within the family uh, commu or community setup, the voice of the child is very important. And there are so many factors that come into play uh, when the voice of the child is being considered. We have issues related to culture, we have issues related uh, uh, to religion, uh, to tribe. So children really need to have their voices heard and respected, and they seem to be considered. And one of the key uh, principles, even within the Children's Act, within the treaties, the UNCRC and the African Charter, is to ensure that everything that is done for a child has to be within the best interest of that child. So yes, their voice has to be heard and they always have to be considered. And adults always have to... Uh, 
make opportunities for children to get these spaces where they can just ventilate and uh, express themselves freely. So definitely their voices are important and they must be considered. And okay. in what you've just seen, um, uh, involving the parents and the children as well maybe having case conferencing even within uh, the children's office or even within the court where we have the families uh, coming into play to ensure that these children are engaged at different levels but also respecting uh, their gender their sex and also other uh, issues maybe related to disability and other needs Okay, and uh, Lillian, even as we think about the marginalized areas, the kangaroo courts have been uh, one way out, but they have also been criticized to have muzzled or to muzzle the children or the rights of the children. Speak on this. Yes, um, the voice of children is very important. Um, as Pauline has indicated, we cannot talk of children's rights without listening to what the children have to say. So platforms have to be created to make sure that the voice of children is heard. And we can use various platforms like community-based mechanisms mm -hmm. where uh, consultations are held, where children are brought forward, and we listen to what they have to say. So even in marginalized and vulnerable communities, whether it's in refugee camps, very poor rural communities, there are systems in place that facilitate child participation and that facilitate the amplification of children's voices so that they too can be listened to and be heard. You know, children also have a voice and very often when you talk of child abuse, uh, we should listen to what the children have to say. They should share their experiences and platforms have to be created to make sure that that happens. Even as they go to police stations in cases children that are in contact with the law, there has to be child uh, protection units where we have trained officers that are able to draw information out of children and be able to hear from them what their concerns are, what the difficulties are, are that they are going through, and we take all that into consideration as decisions are made. So the voice of the children matters, and we really need to intensify creating such platforms to make sure that we amplify their voice. Okay, now let me bring in one of the VVIPs of the day, Billy. If you are with us and you can hear me, when it comes to child participation, how important is this for the children and why does your voice have to be heard? Okay, I think child participation is very important because we are the children ourselves. So if our voice is not being heard, how will we know if we are being treated or if the justice is being taken upon us? If we are getting all the rights that we are supposed to get, I think child participation should really be embraced. I think up to the grassroots level for every child, the voice of every child should be heard from all levels like from the community from the ones who are the starving ones like now you are airing me so this is like child participation you can hear my voice my concern as a child and i think this can also embrace for everyone to know the problem of each child and how to help them and yeah i think child participation is really good thank you Thank you very much for speaking to us. Remember, this is Bill Oteno. He is the Speaker of the Children Assembly in Kisumu County. The Children Assembly is actually in all the 47 counties, and uh, it's actually put together by stakeholders who are looking out for these kids. To be specific, it's put together by the... Services Depart and NCCS. Okay, excellent. Yes. Department of Children Services. Now... Even as we bid you goodbye, Billy, I'd like to hear from Katha because I need to also let you go, Katha. In as far as making sure that the children are part and parcel of this process, that is our friendly justice system, what do we need to learn from each other as a region? Apologies. Um, thank you very much. I think there is, there is quite a lot that we can learn from each other. I think my starting point is one of the, the, the issues that you raised just before we went on the break. And that has to do with how we you know, generally understand and have conversations on access to justice for children. And we are spending a lot of time on access to justice within the formal systems. 
And research is showing increasingly that on the African continent, um, more than 80% of children in, on the continent access justice through informal mechanisms. So I think one of the main lessons that we need to learn from each other across the continent is there are certain countries that are doing better in, in ensuring that you can both through the formal system and the informal system. And through those systems, they have been developed a little bit more. And so they are able to actually deliver justice. Um, and children are, are able to you know, enjoy their rights in this context without, without a very high cost, without uh, the, the possibility of maintaining a criminal record for life and many other advantages that come with an informal justice system. I think that is one of them. Uh, the second issue that we can learn from each other, I think, is the concept of availing accessible justice that is uh, that the institutions speak to one another. So more like a systems approach to justice so that it's not just about children accessing courts, but they are also able to benefit from other services such as um, the, the services of social workers, the services of psychologists, the services of people who are able to enable them to, you know, not just go through the system, but mm -hmm. benefit from going through the system, access justice, but also just benefit from the protections of um, I think the other thing is that we don't share enough of lessons of, of what is working and what is not working. So we have um, some specific examples of certain countries that have done very well, but most of the time it, what we, we do is we, we um, try to reinvent the wheel at national level. So for instance, I would say like um, within the South African context where we have a separate Child Justice Act, and where the system is established in such a way that children's courts are, are very clearly de de, uh, very clearly defined, mm -hmm. uh, and the sector is much easier regulated. We don't transfer those kind of systems and learnings to each and every country. So what we find on the African continent, if you go from country to country, is that each country has sort of a separate idea of how child justice should look like. That makes it very hard for us to speak on a collective voice yeah. as the African continent in, a, in, in terms of how far have we gone, which is why it's even harder for me to tell you who is doing very well, because the parameters are so different from country to country. So harmonization, basically, is, is one of the lessons I hope that as we reflect on the Day of the African Child this year, that we, we take that as one of the things that we need to Okay, that was Dr. Nkatha Murungi, who is the head of the Child and Law Program, Africa Child Policy Forum, ACPF, and she's based in South Africa. And next to her, Billy Omondi, who is the Speaker of the Children Assembly in Kisumu County. Thank you so much for your insights. And of course, we were joined also by Lilian Zozo, who is the National Director at the Wild Vision Kenya. Thank you for your time, and we wish you a lovely day of the African child. Now, Monica, you're still with us on the phone and you actually talked about your experience trying to access justice and you said not getting a chance to have your say in court, no one letting you know what is going on in the first place, why you had been arrested, uh, children being put in the same cell with adults, transport not being availed for you back and forth from court to the rehabilitation center. What would you like the system to look like to be friendly for the children? Okay, mimi chenye ningetaka tu, tunataka a child friendly justice system ambapo ukishikwa na polisi unaelezwa makosa yako kwa lugha unayoelewa. Mm -hmm. Tupeleko kwa rumande ya watoto ama waongeze child protection unit. Kontini kontini watumie lugha ambayo watoto wanaelewa wanaelewa. Mm -hmm. Waache kutuchanganya na watu wazima kwa self Kiti zetu ziarakishwe sio ukienda kotini ni kutoa mention mingi. Okay, very well said. Asante sana Monica, and uh, she is in a statutory uh, institution, meaning she's undergoing rehabilitation. She's 16, going to 17, so she's very articulate on what she'd like to see in the system. And Juliet, I mean, it is very clear what we need to do for the children, but my question is, there are boys and girls in the system. Does, is a justice system even set up to cater for their unique needs? 
Um, well, thank you. Again, I, I just want to say thank you to Monica. I mean, this it's clear that she probably will be an advocate. I hope she becomes an advocate <laughs> or a judge or a magistrate. Yeah. Um, because she speaks very well and knows really what is happening to the children. Uh, first, before I actually go to your question, let me respond to the things that she said she suffered through the system. Yeah. Can I say that all those are violations against her rights, against her constitutional rights, against the Children's Act, against every other treaty that we have signed on as a country? Um, but some of those issues are exacerbated by the law that we have currently, the Children's Act. Um, one of the things I talked about was diversion, and it is not included in the Children's Act. In mm -hmm. fact, that is why it's not even well practiced within the country, because it's not established within the Children's Act. And that is why um, the task force and the Department of Children's Services and the Ministry of Labor came together and said, can we um, amend this law? Can we repeal it and bring on a Children's Act that also talks about the child justice because it, it's a very, uh, it's a missing component link mm -hmm. within the children, within the current Children's Act. Um, and so therefore, the question as to whether the system is, um, separates the children according to their unique needs, plain and simple, no. The system that we have today was, is, a, is an inherited system. The justice system we have today is an inherited justice system. In fact, uh, last year I was con conducting research and I discovered that the remand, um, the remand rehabilitation center in Kabete was actually a, a farm, um, a very big farm. It was a coffee plantation. And um, the reason as to why it was started was because when we were under, uh, when we were a colony uh, uh, of, the, of the British, what happened is when they brought on Africans to come and work in the urban areas, mm -hmm. They brought their children. Now, their children didn't go to school. And because the children didn't go to school, the children were known as delinquents because they would be, you know, grow up and wait. And, uh, and so the, the white man at the time was afraid of this child who did not have a place to go. And so they started this re uh, rehabilitation slash remand home in, in, the, in the farm, in the coffee plantation, where the children would go there to go and work, sort of to be put away and to be separated from the, uh, if you like, the... Um, bourgeoisie of the of the of uh -huh. the nation right mm -hmm. uh, and the people living in the urban centers so that tells me that that system that place need not exist in the first place because what it was essentially doing was separating the children so you have the child of the white man going to school but the child of the black person is not going to school and so we put them away now this system is one of the areas where we still put children until today wow so um, and, and that tells me that we need to rethink, and I like what Dr. Nkata said, we need to rethink our systems and this justice institutions and justice uh, systems. Um, are we, do we really need to go with what we inherited or can we actually change it so that it can actually apply to the specific needs of children? I like what Monica said, that they need to be separated uh, from the adults. But beyond being separated from the adults, these children need to be separated by gender and also by the various um, by the very various things that brings them to to the justice system. Unfortunately, I also came to discover in one of the remand homes that you'll find a child who's in need of care protection. You'll need you'll find a child who is a victim. Yes. And you will find a child who's in conflict with the law. So an example, if you find if uh, there are cases of two children, one having violated another one uh, sexually or physically, you will might very easily find them in the same remand. And yet they have different needs. And this, you know, one is actually did a, uh, committed a crime or yes. an offense against the other one. Yes. And they have different needs. One wants, needs protection and the other one needs to go through the system so that he can be held or she can be held accountable. But they are in the same place. Now, the, the Department of Children's Services is the one that uh, mans or is uh, in charge of all these institutions, what mm -hmm. we call the children holding institutions, so the remand homes and the rehabilitation centers, mm -hmm. and also what we call uh, the reception centers. So ideally what should happen is Monica goes into the remand as the trial goes on. Then after the case is over, the child is taken to um, the, rehab, the reception center, mm -hmm. uh, Gitaduru, that's, that's where it is. Uh, they are held there so that they can actually see where the child needs to go to. What kind of treatment does the child require? Okay. So the child might end up in a rehabilitation center if the, the, uh, the, the court uh, finds that the child is, is answerable or culpable, they'll put them in the, re in the rehabilitation center. Alternatively, they may also uh, serve a probation sentence, mm -hmm. sometimes uh, out of court. 
and they get to, to be rehabilitated. But it is unfortunate, uh, Gladys, if I tell you that some of these children will go through the, the system. I mean, they will be in the re rehab, they'll be able to access education. In the probation, they may also be able to access education and even skills training. Um, but the question is, and when, when we visited those rehabilitation centers, we asked, how many counselors do you have, for instance, uh, so that they can be able to counsel the children, so they can be able to take care of the psychological needs of the children. When we went to the remand homes, we also asked those questions. How many counselors do you have? How many teachers do you have? Yeah. And even the teachers themselves are a great need within the remand homes. I will tell you this for free, that even in the remand homes, there is no uh, formal education uh, going on. So um, I say this to say that the system as it is, is not friendly yet. I mean, we have, uh, we have a pathway and a plan. Yes. yes, we do have a plan. We do have a pathway. We know what needs to be done. We just now need to put our money where our mouth is. That's what needs to happen. Well said. Thank now, you. it's the Day of the African Child. Our question to you today is, what has been your experience accessing justice on behalf of a child? It could also be on your own behalf when you are younger and who, who has been in conflict or, with the law or had their rights violated. What's your experience? And uh, a lot of you are speaking to us. There is Pence there who's, uh, who says it's irritating, painful and haunting, not just a child, but children whose rights were either directly or indirectly violated from the same government or by the same government. We hear you, Pence. Another one here from Felix Mundo who says, I have a case of one who was raped and killed under police custody. Nothing new seems to, we will never talk of justice. So, nothing new seems we'll never talk of justice. Sounds very desperate, but yeah, this is what we are trying to change even as we precisely set up such days to speak and take stock of uh, the justice system. And uh, Maderi Wambogo says, preach more than just discrimination because the African child is facing crisis even from his fellow African uh, children or the Africans. Yeah, that is actually a very good point. And uh, we have another from uh, Abdullahi who says, you wonder why we we have a lot of youth who lack humility in front of elders? Children are supposed to be raised and nurtured appropriately depending on where they come from. Children assembling isn't an African culture. Let's allow our children to learn the values of their cultures. Well, times are changing, dynamics are changing. It is important to actually congregate kids in that child assembly so they can understand what governance is from their time with their kids. Madari Wambogo says, it's very true, a lot has changed, and we highly appreciate the fact, but, uh, the, that fact, but are the laws being followed to the letter? Are the law, or is the law instrument still working? Very good question, and that's what we're trying to answer this morning. Fred Shimwenyi, who says, this is an educative forum, particularly these darkest days of COVID-19 issue to do with child labor, child protection. Just supplement a feeding basket to the family. A case study is in Kakamega County, which has yielded some early pregnancies. And this is a big blow to parents. It should be the duty of every, every stakeholder, as far as families, individuals, and even counties as a whole, to be concerned about the children. We hear you. And yes, it is time everyone sat up and took note of the rights of the children and even particularly as they try to access the justice system the system needs to be friendly enough to accommodate them now we take another short break right here on your world when we return we'll actually be joined by justice martha come she is the chair of the ncaj special task force on children martyrs and we'll also be joined by sankara caroline who's the executive director at Hili dada they have a campaign they've been running called the girls bills of rights and that is in the process of uh, being ratified but something needs to happen for that to be a reality to stay with us to find out.
Jeremiah Nyaga was given the freedom of the city of Nairobi by Mayor Dick Wadika. For his exceptional service to World Scouting, he was, in 1982, awarded the Bronze Wolf, the only distinction of the World Organization of the Scout Movement. He was a uh, chief commission for Kenya Scout for many, many years. Nyaga had groomed his elder sons, Joseph and Norman, to venture into politics. He played an active role in campaigning for Norman, who succeeded him as the Gashoka MP in 1992. In these uncertain times, as we navigate the new normal, we hope that this note finds you and your family safe. We are indeed living in an increasingly challenging time, a time of disruption and a global lockdown, a disruption that has brought grief to some, financial difficulties to so many of us, and enormous changes to life as we know it. Now, though self-isolation may at times be hard, many people are discovering that it presents an opportunity for all of us to slow down, to pause and reflect Many will feel a painful sense of separation from their loved ones, but we know that deep down that is the right thing to do. We should take comfort that while we may have more still to endure, better days will return. And even as we navigate this new normal, your favorite show, The Trend, promises you to continue providing a huge variety of splendid entertainment full of iconic acts, Skype interviews with our local entertainment industry heroes. And we continuously promise to bring you nothing but the best. You, our viewer, we want to provide a steady guide of entertainment as we face the future. Staying in is the new going out. Stay home and stay safe. Make sure that you tune to The Trend every Friday right here on MTV. East Africa is transforming. And so are we. We are now more diverse, more visual, more engaging. Grab a copy of the new East African. To subscribe, email subscription at ke.nationmedia.com or ePaper at ke.nationmedia.com. The jury has decided. The Kenya Film Commission is delighted to announce the shortlisted 20 nominees for the third edition of My Kenya My Story mobile phone film competition. Join the commission on Wednesday, 17th June for the nominees unveil live on NTV from 7.30pm and get to know who scoops the top prize of 200,000 shillings during the award ceremony slated for 30th June 2020. Kenya Film Commission. Film Kenya. Capture Africa. Amar Sanitizer is an alcohol-based sanitizer containing ethanol which has a broad spectrum antimicrobial activity killing bacteria, viruses and fungi. Amar Sanitizer is enriched with aloe vera making it gentle on your hands. It is your world. My name is Gladys Gashanja as we celebrate the day of the African child. Access to a child-friendly justice system is the theme of the day and I must say I've learned a lot in as far as that is concerned and even the general rights of the children. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we will be joined or are now joined by Justice Martha Kombe. She is the lead of the NCAJ Special Task Force on Children Martyrs and also joined by Sankara Caroline who is the Executive Director for Akili Dada. But before the ladies get into the conversation, let's take a trip around the world and students from a New Hampshire high school take ski lifts to attend a graduation ceremony at the top of a local mountain. Since large groups can no longer gather as a result of the coronavirus pandemic, Kennet High School came up with an imaginative way for students to graduate in person whilst maintaining social distancing. You know, we didn't want to do just a drive through we wanted to do something special and, and this is really symbolic of the Mount Washington Valley. So when this all started like happening I was obviously just super nervous about 
kind of what was going on and what we would get to, if we were going to get a graduation or if we would get to see our friends before the school year ended. Um, but so I was kind of expecting a virtual graduation or maybe not one at all. But for them to like put together all this and get to go up all the way up Cranmore and take photos and also just see people like passing, I thought it was so cool. It meant a lot. It was nice that we didn't have a virtual one and it was in person. I could see all like my teachers and principal and then receive my diploma in person, obviously, which is nice. Incredible experience being able to go to the top of the mountain, receive my diploma up there against the backdrop of my hometown. It's incredible. Getting used to the hashtag new normal. Now over to Sierra Leone in the continent and the Takugama chimpanzee sanctuary where 96 chimpanzees rescued from the forest as sheltered has been under strict lockdown for the past two months. Now opened 25 years ago, the center has just recovered from the Ebola crisis that is in between 2014 and 2016 and its management team now fears for its economical survival as it usually makes most of its income from visitors. Now the center rehabilitates chimps which were rescued after mistreatment from owners or orphaned after their families were hunted in the wild for bush meat. And closer home, the Ugandan government caused outrage when it announced in late November that it was authorizing a consortium led by Bonang Power and Energy to conduct a feasibility study on the construction of a 360 megawatt dam in the Matchison Falls National Park. Decide on that. We cannot be just uh, uh, say no or yes without a feasibility study. Our tourism industry will be. Um, we we'll lose a lot and uh, we are getting a bit of money in that industry. So if we lose, if we put on a dam, we are losing what the reason why people come here. I would prefer that it is preserved as a national heritage. Indeed, <clears throat> it is the flagship attraction for the Murchison Falls. I've been here quite a couple of times and uh, I'll tell you I keep coming here because of the attraction that falls uh, offers. We lost Bujagali Falls, we lost Isimba, we lost uh, Karoma Falls, Agago is going, and several other falls, in fact, in the country. Why don't we spare this particular one? Are we going to dot the entire Nile with dams? Well, it is your world even as we come to terms with the disruption of the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, as I mentioned, we are now joined by Justice Martha Kome and also Sankara Caroline, who's ex Executive Director at the Akili Dada. Uh, Sankara, maybe you can start off by explaining to us what exactly the Girls' Bills of Rights is. Yes, so thank you. Let me begin by saying that the theme for the day today is very critical. It's very important. Um, for lasting social and economic progress in Africa to be realized, we really must focus on the children because the children are just simply our heritage. Um, that said, uh, more than 130 million girls worldwide are out of school. One girl under the age of 15 gets married every seven seconds worldwide. So the Girl Bill of Rights is actually, um, it's a document that uh, was written by girls from 34 countries, 16 countries uh, in Africa. And this Bill of Rights just highlighted things that the girls thought and the girls believe are actually very important to them. So the Girl Bill of Rights, so there are 10 rights. Um, I'll go through them very quickly. One is the right to free education. Second is to equality. Third, the involvement in decision making and pursuit of leadership positions. Fourth is documentation. Fifth, comprehensive sexual education and access to free and quality reproductive health care. Sixth is protection from harmful traditions and enjoyment of positive cultural practices. Seven, safety from all forms of violence. Eight, decision making about their body and sexuality. Nine, protection under the law without fear of unequal treatment. And 10, freedom from exploitation. 
So when you listen to these rights that the girls want are ratified and advocated for within our communities and our world uh, uh, globally, you realize that these are not unique rights. These are not rights that are outside of the box. Mm -hmm. So girls are actually asking for things that are within our constitutions. These are things that have already been listed in the UN Convention of Rights of Children, African Charter of Rights and Welfare of the Child. And um, a day such as this where we are talking about access to child-friendly justice systems is not a day where we are supposed to continue advocating for things that we've been advocating for since 1976 when the kids in Soweto were marching on the streets and there was a massacre. Mm -hmm. So if you think about it, these are things that we are supposed to have already upheld. These are rights that girls won't achieve. And, um, you know, yes, there's the argument between boys and girls. And we, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's quite a traditional um, argument. But then the truth is that systemically and historically, the girl and the woman has actually been marginalized for a very long time. So these girls who put this together, this document has gone all the way to the UN headquarters and has been presented to the UN women uh, representative. Mm -hmm. And right now what we are trying to do is we want it ratified. So far, so good. 376 people across the world have ratified it. We need 100 million signatures. The essence of it being ratified is so that governments can now amplify it. Organizations that are bigger, uh, or even even civil society that are more regional, are also able to amplify it. And this might just get into law. And um, yeah, so that's where Akili Dada is coming from. And thank you so much for holding this conversation at a time such as now. It's very critical. And thank you. Okay. Now, Justice Koma, just listening to Sankara, it makes me wonder. We have seen very many laws passed through the years, even since the our 2010 new constitution. Why is it that we seem to be very lax in making the rights of the children a reality? Uh, thank you very much, um, Gladys, for inviting me to this panel. And it is indeed... Uh, my privilege to appear with eminent and fierce defenders of uh, girls' rights, uh, children's rights, uh, like Caro and uh, Juliet. Uh, the issue of um, children's rights is central because children are the greatest stakeholders um, in everything that we do just like they realized um, many years, 44 years ago, that they had to stand up and fight for their rights against apartheid. Uh, the struggle continues. African child lives still matters today. So the constitution of Kenya is very explicit in defining the fundamental rights of children mm -hmm. and access to justice, their participation is secured in the constitution. But gradis, that needed also to be translated into a registration, an act of parliament. Mm -hmm. Two of the children act is necessary. You may ask why so many laws? Of course, I agree implementation is a problem because all those rights uh, Carol has talked about feature, mm -hmm. but the implementation is a problem. So that is why we continuously ask that we simplify the laws into policies, into legislation, into operating procedures that help us understand easily how to deal with a child. Like the children bill that is now pending and everybody is asking why it has been pending for the last 10 years since the promulgation of the constitution 2010 mm -hmm. yes. has two very unique features. One, diversion. So that children do not have to go through the justice formal system. Yes, You've read our report. It says 80% of children in justice holding institutions ought not to be there. Mm -hmm. They ought to be diverted. And also the criminal age of responsibility is too low. It's eight years. So when you go to the rehabilitation centers in Kenya, the remand homes, it is full of children, little children under the age of uh, 12 who do not even know who they are, leave alone 
what offense they have committed. So we are asking justice does not just begin in the courts of law. Mm -hmm. It begins from the family to the community. And it is a collaborative effort when a child has committed an offense or um, is in conflict with the law. We say it's because of a failure of a system. The family has failed to direct the child to cancel them uh, so that they have fallen afoul with the law. So when the police arrest the child, they are not supposed to battle that child in the cells and uh, produce that child to court. They are supposed to find out from the parents and the social worker and probably the chairman of Jumba Kumi and the teacher what mm. is the problem with the child. And because these many of these are infractions, the children have uh, probably stolen something so that they can sell and buy maybe a phone or something. Mm -hmm. Those issues ought not to be escalated to the court because the experience is that when you go through the formal justice system, it handles you. It changes you, not in the positive, but in the negative. So we need to protect our children. We need to provide for them a system that can always secure their best interests. Okay, we hear you, Justice Kome. And uh, Sankara, I'm curious to know, what would it take for this to be ratified right here in Kenya? So what it would take for this to be ratified in Kenya is for one civil society to rise and amplify this Bill of Rights. That's one. Then two, obviously, the media has a very important role to play. And, um, you know, what we've, we've experienced over time is that a lot of organizations work in silos. And it's the same thing, uh, you know, that the lady, uh, the, Dr. Nkata, was highlighting mm -hmm. around, you know, harmonization. Can we all work together? Can we all use the instruments that are, are already you know, in a, we, within our disposal for us to actually advocate for things, you know, through one voice. That way no people are not operating from like, you know, different spaces and different places. So there's a website that is a gbor.org. So if you go in there, you have access, click on it, read it again. They are just 10 rights and then go ahead and ratify. And this was put together by Akili Dada and an organization called She's the First and Maya. Excellent. Now, we said today is the Day of the African Child, so we have the real VVIPs. We had two before in the previous hour. Now, we have one in this hour. Her name is Joyce Nyawera. Joyce, karibu sana, and uh, happy Day of the African Child. Can you hear me? Okay, I seem to not be hearing her, but we shall be getting to her in a moment. And uh, let me come back to you, Pauline. Even as we think about rehabilitating our children, I see a, que a question here. And uh, let me relate it to the UN Convention on the Rights of Children, which prohibits life imprisonment without possibility of release or capital punishment for those under the 18 years of age. To be precise, Article 37. Is this the reality here in Kenya from your experience? Um, uh, thank you, Gladys. This is not necessarily the reality um, in what is happening. And uh, just to respond to that, uh, in the discussions that have been going on previously on how we need to handle these children, we need to come up with uh, programs that take into account, one, their development, to ensure they are also able to access certain services, to ensure that they are able to be rehabilitated and are also reformed, to ensure that uh, they are able to also access other skills in the mm -hmm. specific spaces where they find themselves. So detaining children will uh, m make them retrogress in terms of development, and they are not able to continue with fully developing as children and engaging at that level. So this is why we are also calling for the enactment of a children bill, just to emphasize that some of these programs are actually in that bill. For example, diversion that had already been mentioned, and other uh, platforms where these children can be able to engage. Thank you. And uh, Justice Kome, I'm curious to know, with the re recent or the current pandemic, how has that now gone to put to the fore or shine glaring, uh, you know, issues in the system in as far as kids are concerned? And what did the, uh, 
the tribunal or rather the task force come up with as recommendations? Uh, thank you. The recommendations by the NCAJ Special Task Force mm -hmm. on Children Matters was very, very clear that detention or deprivation of liberty of children should be as a matter of last resort. Family is identified as the best institution to mm -hmm. nurture the child. The Children Act the one we are seeking to be reviewed is also very clear that children matters should be handled expeditiously. In this country, I think we only have two laws that have a time frame within which a case should be completed. And that is the Children Act that provides for between three months and six months at the maximum uh, a child should never, never be in court for a year. And the REC Act. You all know the Elections Act is foreign religiously. There is no election petition that goes beyond um, six months. But when it comes to children matters, because of one problem and the other, and because the justice system works as a chain link, one institution if one institution is weak, it mm. weakens everybody else. It doesn't yeah. matter how good you are. If we are so good and efficient as the judiciary, mm -hmm. then we need the police to be also up to scratch in terms of uh, investigations, the prosecution as well, and also the children officers, who are the social workers who provide um, the social report, mm -hmm. and also the parents or the community who support the child to come to court as a witness to ensure that all that happens without any delay. So because of this uh, elaborate coordination that is required to ensure the best interest of the child, sometimes there is a delay. Uh, but we try as much as possible. The task force has recommended there should be service weeks conducted by every court station mm -hmm. regularly to only focus one week in a month or after two months on only children matters, mop them up, ensure there is no backlog, and ensure that no child is being detained. And the same form of uh, task force is cascaded to the court level, and we call it Child Court Users Committee. That uh -huh. is the one that monitors on a daily basis what is happening to children. But before I stop, I also want uh, to acknowledge uh, what is being done um, by Caro um, by highlighting the plight of the girl child, because those are also our concern. Because like uh, last year, but one, we were faced with a pandemic, almost like the COVID of so many girls getting pregnant, mm. um, you know, like 500,000 girls getting pregnant, that browse back yes. all the gains that we have made because mm. those are very many cases of poverty. Yeah. So I agree, whatever efforts are being made to ensure that we protect these girls from early child marriages, early pregnancies, should be supported by everybody because Where it is their human rights and mm. it's the right thing to do. Very well said. And uh, even as we wrap up this conversation in a few, few statements, maybe from you, Juliet, how is it possible to achieve a child-friendly, sensitive justice system in this country, considering the circumstances we just highlighted? Um, yes, it is. It is absolutely possible to achieve it because, as I said, um, I'm, you know, short of, I think, 10 years now in mm -hmm. practice. And I can tell you when I first walked into a court, uh, to represent a child who was a victim. I was, a, I, as a lawyer, I didn't have a voice to be able to represent the child, but the Victim Protection Act came in and gave me a voice to be able to represent this child. Mm -hmm. I could only then be able to uh, advise the prosecutor, but now I can be able to do it. Um, I can tell you that uh, the prosecution, for instance, did not have a department on children matters, and so therefore a child would be prosecuted, as Monica said, just like an adult. You'd have uh, moments where a child is giving their evidence 
that they're being shouted at. They're being told, no, onge uh, araka, you know. But um, we went into these courts and we talked to the prosecutors. We talked to, uh, we talked to the police. And now we have a, a DCI child protection system uh, unit. We have a department within the DPP uh, mm -hmm. that is focused on children. We have a National uh, Council on Administration of Justice Task Force for Children Matters. I tell you, there is a lot of possibilities. There's only one thing we need to do. We need to put our money where our mouth is. Uh -huh. We must. You see, um, Article 19 of the UNCRC talks about the government or the, uh, the responsibility of the state to take care of children uh, from all violence. And it says in decision making, administratively, legally. I mean, if, if, the, if parliament needed a law to help them establish as to why they need to give as much money as they can to children, mm -hmm. that article, which is law in Kenya because of the constitution, uh, the UNCRC demands of us as a state to actually put money to protecting our children. And so therefore, we need to look at it in those facets that I said, infrastructure, uh, practice, policy, language, break it down to the very everyday need of a child and it will be established, but we need the money. That is one of the things that is really, really needed. And of course, we need to pass the children bill because that's the only law right now that actually focuses on a child. And do you know what else it does? It helps the child to create de uh, demand. You see, um, until the child is able to ask for their rights, we will just be having people like you and I uh, and a few others to try and push and advocate for these rights. We need the child to demand for his or her own rights. And speaking of which, before I call it today, let's hear from Joyce Nyawira. You have been a child rights activist, a child yourself. What is the one thing you would like to stand out on this day of the African child in as far as being heard and being protected? Well... First of all, I'm glad to join the show. And I am really happy and I'm a very proud African child because I believe that the future of Africa lies on me and all the other children across the board. But today as we celebrate Day of the African Child, there are some rights that really stand out for us. We have the... Um, we have the right to education mm -hmm. okay today as i was going through the kenyan constitution chapter four of the constitution the bill of rights uh and also section 54 53 of it we can see the constitution has clearly outlined the rights of children everywhere mm -hmm. but it is so saddening that we have the, the rights in just written form, but I feel like most of the laws, most of the policies are just written, but we don't have the execution of it. That is why you'll find that most children do have a voice, but they're not given an opportunity to air them. So I feel as we celebrate this day of the African child, one of the main, main thing that we should focus on is to help children with platforms to air their views, and also be part of the policies and the execution part of the policies that are made. Thank okay, you. very well said. The real VVIPs of this day, which are the children, even as we mark the day of the African child. Very thankful for all the panelists that were part and parcel of this conversation. We've learned a lot and clearly a lot of suggestions put across there and the stakeholders we hope have heard and this will be implemented in achieving and safeguarding the rights and the welfare of the children. Now as I bid you goodbye in the spirit of appreciating all African children, we welcome you to sing with Damien Soul and Ubongo Kids on the day of the African child. Enjoy. My my name is Gladys Gashanja. See you tomorrow, but Joseph Warungu will be the one on the driver's seat.
I help women find independence by training them in fish farm. Oh, it's tough on my back, joints, and can cause headaches. Panadol Extra relieves multiple types of pain. If symptoms persist, seek medical advice.